one of the most important sculpture discoveries of recent times, is set to go on sale at Christie's Auction House in London, England. The rare bronze relief was acquired by an English gentleman travelling on the Grand Tour in the 1740s. It depicts Venus, Mars, Cupid and Vulcan and lay forgotten in the cupboard under the stairs of a private house for several decades and was only dusted off again this summer. Its owners have since discovered that the bronze dates back to the period 1480-1500 and was made in the Mantua region of Italy. It's extremely large for a bronze of that date and is of fantastic quality. It has been valued at over 2.5 million US dollars. As the relief is so rare, its discovery has caused quite a stir in the art world and speculation is mounting as to who will buy it. London Art Gallery Tate Britain has just unveiled its latest piece of interactive art. Blessed Bandwidth is an unusual blessing service available on the internet and covers six religions from around the world. Anyone can log onto the site and receive a blessing in the religion of their choice – Muslim, Sikh, Jewish, Buddhist, Christian or Hindu. But the work is not just about religion, it gets people to think about the world they live in today. Indian artist Shilpa Gupta created Blessed Bandwidth. In the closet section, gods can be dressed in a range of costumes before the blessing is received. It's hoped the theme will encourage internet users to visit the site. So far, users of the site at the gallery have found it to be a stimulating experience. Being online gives contemporary artwork like Blessed Bandwidth a global audience who can focus on the theme of religion while reflecting on its role in society today. And in further news from London, British lighting designer Paul Coxedge, a graduate from the Royal College of Art, has scooped this year's $25,000 US dollars Bombay Sapphire Prize. The prestigious award is only in its second year, but has been set up to find the very best of new glass design. And in Paul's case, it was awarded for his novel glass light that turns conventional technology on its head. It produces a light that's both beautiful and technically groundbreaking. His creation called Neon is a single wire light that glows amber when turned on, but shows the elegance of the glass when switched off. It came about by rethinking conventional lighting technology. The light has been specifically designed to make it look simple and not to be too overpowering. Paul isn't resting on his laurels despite the prestigious win. He's already working on new lighting projects to improve on his success so far. From over 500 entries, just 22 were shortlisted for the final. Given that large amount of interest, the prize shows the growing level of talent the UK has in contemporary glass design. Cutting up seabirds to look for debris in their stomachs might seem macabre, but recent research conducted in the Netherlands has found this to be a great way to monitor the trash floating on the North Sea. Marine litter is one of the major problems of the area, entangling mammals, poisoning fish and hurting the tourism industry. Combating the problem, however, is difficult without knowing precisely what the garbage is and where it came from. Uh, and now a Dutch scientist has discovered an unusual instrument F. to monitor it. I don't think there's any oil in the feathers, no. The fulmar, a species of seabird related to the albatross, has an unfortunate habit of eating almost everything. And while this is often deadly, it allows biologist Jan Andries van Franeke to record changes in the North Sea pollution and set reduction targets. Working from Altera, a marine institute on the Dutch North Sea island of Texel, Van Franeke has peered into the stomachs of dead fulmars found on beaches for more than 20 years. Okay. Well, the proventriculus seems empty. But the case of this really hard. Apart from natural food, fulmars also carry a high amount of domestic waste in their stomachs such as bottle caps, cigarette filters, ropes and fish hooks. Industrial Such pellets, waste remains lodged in the bird's plastic. stomachs until it's worn down and is able to pass through. But not all waste wears down. There's a variety of stuff in here. The European Union has been so convinced by Van Franeke's work that it has asked him to expand his research to the entire North Sea region as part of their three-year campaign to save the North Sea. 
From Belgium's sandy beaches and the docks of northern Germany to Norway's rugged fjords and the Scottish cliffs, biologists now collect dead fulmars and send their frozen carcasses to von Franeker. Von Franeke says on average, fulmars from the southern part of the North Sea carry 30 pieces of plastic in their stomachs. In human proportions, that would be a lunchbox full. First results also show that fulmars from the southern region of the North Sea carry much more plastics in their stomachs than those found around the Shetland and Faroe Islands. This suggests that there is a local problem with marine litter. So, in an effort to clean up the sea, the European Union is raising awareness among fishermen, shipping companies, industries and tourists. In one of the projects, fishermen are asked to bring ashore the litter caught in their nets instead of dumping it back into the sea. Since the litter recovery project started one and a half years ago, 17 Dutch fishing boats have brought back 100,000 kilos of trash. That's quite an amount. But compared to the 20 million kilos of litter dumped into the North Sea annually, it's clear that more needs to be done before Van Franeke will find no more plastic in a dead Fulmar's stomach. The world's hairiest men strutted their stuff recently at the World Beard and Mustache Championships held in Carson City in the United States. But before competition took place, the contestants were invited to take part in the annual Nevada Day Parade, which marks the anniversary of Nevada becoming a U.S. state. Thousands of people lined the streets of Carson City to watch, and they couldn't believe their eyes when the beard and mustache crowd appeared. The World Beard and Mustache Championships are held every two years, but this is the first time they've ever been held outside Europe. It all began in the Black Forest village of Poffenens, Germany in 1990, when the first Poffener Beard Club members got together and decided to hold a competition in their village. Since then, the championships have been held several times in Germany and also in Norway and Sweden, and they have become so popular that beard and moustache clubs have since sprung up in at least nine countries worldwide. There are 17 categories of competition in all, and participants travelled from Austria, England, Germany, Hong Kong, Italy, Sweden, Norway and Switzerland to take part. However, just growing a beard or moustache isn't enough. There are specific rules for each category, and in some cases the use of styling aids is not allowed, but in the freestyle categories, anything goes. Jörg Billund of Switzerland was named champion in the freestyle goatee section. A tremendous amount of primping and preening goes on behind closed doors before a competition takes place. And some of the more exotic looks are just too hard to maintain in everyday life. The audience loved all the different designs and artistic nuances of each category and cheered long and loud all night long. And while all those whiskers might not appeal to everyone, they're certainly an amazing sight. Of the 17 World Champion trophies up for grabs, Germany won seven categories. Italy, Switzerland, Hong Kong and Austria took one category each. England came out top in two and the United States won four. For the Americans, it was as much about taking part as it was about winning, but they were very happy to be hosting the championship and clearly appreciated how much it meant to their European cousins. The next World Beard and Moustache Championship will take place in Berlin, Germany in 2005, while London, England will play host in 2007. A galaxy of stars from the world of music, acting and fashion have joined forces to put on an exhibition of their own photographs to come to the aid of the Red Cross. Actress Nicole Kidman, supermodel Kate Moss and musician Dave Stewart are better known for performing in front of the cameras, but this time they are on the other side of the lens. Appropriately named On the Other Side of the Lens, the exhibition opened in much fanfare at the Tram Studios in London before embarking on a European tour. Michael Stipe, lead singer with the rock band R.E.M., also contributed a selection of his photographs to the exhibition and welcomed the chance to work with the Red Cross. Model Helena Christensen was another who joined the cause for charity. A great diversity of subjects could be found amongst the photographs on display. On the other side of the lens, which is accompanied by a commemorative book,
travelled across London, Paris, Berlin, Milan and Stockholm. And welcome to the supermarket with a difference. The shelves here are stocked with something other than washing powder and cereal. This is an art supermarket, and if your wallet isn't big enough for a Picasso or a Monet, but you want an original art piece, it's all here. It's cheaper than an auction, and you'll walk away with authentic works. Helga Berger, co-founder of the art supermarket, said that the aim behind the concept was to get the public interested in art and take away people's fears of looking at art. And in fulfilling that aim, customers have the choice between some 6,000 original watercolour paintings, acrylic and oil paintings, sculptures and drawings, and even photographs made by 75 different artists. Everything is represented here. And customers seem to like what is on display in this office building on Berlin's posh Friedrichstrasse. This woman really liked the idea of good art being available at decent prices. She also was impressed at the variety of styles on offer, whereas at an art gallery there might only be one artist exhibiting their work. She ended up taking home a painting. Another male customer thought that the whole idea was an interesting concept, with affordable art a big highlight. Richard Stum, one of the artists with works available for sale, was pleased with the results so far. And with prices fixed in a range between 58 and 353 US dollars, people know from the outset what to expect from their shopping. Not surprisingly though, there has been criticism, calling the art supermarket cheap in every sense of the word. But Richard came to its defence. While accepting that certain people don't endorse the idea, including some artists, he believes that there's some hypocrisy involved in that dislike. An artist seems to be expected to hide away in a rooftop workspace and starve for the occupation, or perhaps get lucky and exhibit in art galleries. For Richard, there must be something useful in between, and he believes that the art supermarket fulfils that role. Meanwhile, there were plenty of customers apparently enjoying the experience and not concerned at all that they weren't browsing in an art gallery. And a quick trip to the checkout and an original piece of art is about to grace the home of its new owner. It's hoped that the art supermarket will fulfill that middle-of-the-road gap in the market and whatever you view, it might just be the right place to pop in to shop for that unusual and special gift for a loved one. Lover or hater, she's probably the most sold doll in the world. With her blonde locks and good looks, Barbie is many a little girl's best friend. So much so that sometimes when the girls grow up, Barbie continues to be their faithful companion. As the world's most famous doll turns 45, Germany's only Barbie clinic helps to ensure that the darling of millions of little girls will never become extinct. Bettina Dorfmann is one of countless children who grew up playing with a Barbie doll. As she became older, they were packed away, only to be rediscovered when her own daughter was growing up. Bettina has collected more than 2,000 Barbie dolls over the years and claims that she never really planned to become a collector. Her affection for the Barbie doll dates back to her childhood when she and two girlfriends would play with them and make clothes and houses for them. And this has all grown from these humble beginnings. The Barbie doll was first introduced at the 1959 New York Toy Fair. The Mattel Toy Company's founder Ruth Handler presented Barbie to the world and in the very first year it sold more than 350,000 times. Over the years not only Ken but several friends have joined Barbie and cats, dogs, horses, cars and campers have been added to the collection. Here are just some of Bettina's exhibits. Barbie's career path included being a flight attendant with plenty of airlines offering to provide their uniforms for Barbie to wear. Clothing and accessories are also big business, especially if they still have their original packaging. A 
As an avid collector of Barbies, Bettina is often asked to do exhibits on special occasions, and she has even delivered lectures on the timeless toy. It's a career path that she never dreamt possible. And judging by these displays, Bettina has certainly got plenty to talk about. Today, Bettina runs Germany's only Barbie clinic. She performs repairs each day with people constantly knocking on her door or sending packages. Lip painting, eye painting and hair repairs, body repair or replacement and clothes restoration are all part of Bettina's hectic schedule and she loves it. With the help of Germany's Bettina Dorfmann, Barbie is set to stay alive for at least another 45 years. Meanwhile, an exhibition of a different kind was gracing the Dutch city of Eindhoven. While temperatures were still far above freezing point, a white winter arrived early with the opening of a giant covered ice and snow sculpture exhibition. Set up next to the town hall, a huge 2,500 square meters refrigerated building housed the exhibition, one of the biggest of its kind in the world. And it took six giant air conditioners to keep the dozens of enchanting ice and snow sculptures cold. A team of 50 artists from all over the world worked for three weeks to transform truckloads of snow and blocks of ice into refined crystal-like sculptures. Using chainsaws, chisels and polishing machines, the artists worked in temperatures of around minus 8 degrees Celsius to prevent their sculptures from melting. The theme of the exhibition was appropriately winter time in a fairy tale world. It featured a giant sculpture of King Winter and his consort, a skating ring and an ice gala. Plutschow might be a small eastern German town, but it has some pretty big foreign residents. Sonny Frank keeps five fully grown African elephants on his farm. The former circus trainer is hoping to be able to breed his elephant bull Shahib with his four elephant cows Timba, Mala, Kenya and Balumba. Very few elephants are born in captivity and Sonny wants to provide elephants for circuses which are normally the last on the list to receive them. Sonny's family are seventh generation circus folk and elephants have been his passion since he was 11. The five animals that the family own were brought from Africa where they had been orphaned in controlled wildlife culling. And there are plenty of visitors who come to the farm to see the elephants. Sonny said that it doesn't matter where the elephants are reared. When they arrived in Europe, they were babies. They grew up there and have become accustomed to their habitat. Instead of eating African coconuts or African plants, they eat normal Mecklenburg oats and German bread, and they seem to like it just as much. Sonny believes they are now European in all ways. And Shaib certainly appears to be right at home in his surroundings, letting the cameraman know exactly what he thinks. Sonny transports the elephants under the Washington Treaty of Animal Protection. Kenya and Balumba are his oldest elephants. They are 15 years of age. Sonny's neighbor, Marianne Brush, thinks having elephants as neighbors is great. She is particularly happy to help Sonny get rid of the elephant manure, saying that she now grows huge potatoes and has the elephants to thank for it. Sonny believes that it's only a matter of time before the last circus elephants die and is willing to let elephant cows from zoos and safaris stay at the farm in the hope that they will mate with his bull. But ultimately he just wants to make sure that future generations can enjoy these gentle giants. 
Over in Britain, the inaugural National Recycling Week has taken place. It's a business-sponsored campaign designed to make consumers more aware of the environmental and safety benefits to be gained from recycling more of our domestic and office waste. And recycling used cartridges from your computer's printer can cut back on that waste even further and protect the environment from toxic chemicals. That's the message being delivered from recycling companies. Tommy's, the charity that funds research into infant death, is one of the organisations that get financial support from the cartridge recycling scheme. Charities in France, Germany and Spain have also received donations. The scheme's total donations, boosted by National Recycling Week, are expected to reach over 1.7 million US dollars next year. The recent World Travel Market Convention was the opportunity for Britain's Tourism Minister to open a special youth pavilion to highlight the importance of the youth travel market, now estimated to be worth around 130 billion US dollars a year. The pavilion was set up by the British Educational Travel Association, or BETTER, which encompasses 70 companies all looking to tap into the youth market. Its aim is to highlight the importance of youth travel, provide young people with stimulating and interesting travel opportunities, and more valid information for their travel plans. And with the growth of the gap year phenomenon, where students take a year off before going to university, it's becoming an even bigger market. It's also felt that young travellers make an important economic contribution to local regions, often staying much longer than the average tourist or business visitor around 21 to 28 days in Britain's case. BETA expects to have 200 organisations on board by next year as they tap into the growing and increasingly lucrative youth travel market. And in our final story this week, it's winter in Europe, a season of colds and flu, and the serious version of the latter, the influenza A virus, can be a killer, especially for the young and elderly. But British scientists may have found an answer. A new strategy to treat symptoms of the flu virus has been developed by scientists at Imperial College in London. The implications would bring a breakthrough in the treatment of a disease that can reach epidemic proportions. Research so far has concentrated on how mice reacted to inhibiting a molecule called OX40, which gets rid of the symptoms without impairing the clearance of the virus, and results have been impressive. If tests on humans bring similar results, a new method of treatment would have been created for those showing serious flu symptoms. And the flu virus cannot be taken lightly. The outbreak just after the First World War is thought to have killed over 20 million people. And in recent years, the SARS virus has thrown national medical symptoms around the world into disarray. The scientists at Imperial College are leading the way in research that could radically improve treatment of viral disease.